first I'd like to welcome all of you to our, uh, our seminar on drug repurposing. I'm June Lee, uh, Director of Early Translational Research at the CTSI at UCSF. We have a really interesting seminar today, our panel, um, a pretty distinguished panel of folks who are going to help us to wade through uh, the opportunities and challenges of uh, drug repurposing. My time up here is very short, so quickly we have we have uh, Brian Atwood from Versa Ventures, who's going to present um, the venture investor perspective of, of drug repurposing. We have Willie Quinn from Bullet Bio, CEO of Bullet Bio, Cyril DeCole, and Ken Horn, all from um, from the perspective of moving a project that's uh, drug purposing in nature through development, as well as Ellen Harden, uh, Harden who's uh, from Gilead, who will be presenting uh, some regulatory and legal aspects of moving a project through that way. And then um, they're going to have a chance to talk a little bit more about, uh, more in detail about their experience and their perspective. And then quickly, um, I want to thank our partners and uh, sponsors. So QB3 Entrepreneurship Center at UCSF and UCSF ITA are all partners in putting this seminar on together. And then Shepard Mullins, who's sponsoring um, us with a nice food outside. And then before I move um, off the stage, I'm just going to remind all of you about the Catalyst program, which is a program that's run out of ETR. And our due date for the applications for the SYNC cycle is... September 22nd, and um, uh, many of you already know what the Catalyst Program is, but for those of you who don't, it's a, it's a mechanism by which you can get funding as well as industry expert help to move a project along that, that, that's moving toward a product. So a, a special highlight um, for this project, for, for this cycle, is if your project is a project that is of interest to our partner, Metamune, then you can get up to $250,000 of funding, so something to keep in mind. And quickly, so if you have any questions about the Catalyst program, Kathy would be a great person to touch base with, and she's going to be up here in a second, so you'll see what she looks like. Um, and other folks I'm seeing in the ETR group who might be able to answer questions, there's Ruben back there. Ruben, raise your hand. And Irina? Irina, so uh, Ruben, overall questions. Irina oversees the diagnostics and devices track. Um, Kathy oversees the therapeutics track. And is Einar here? So digital, we have a digital health track as well. So any of those, if you have questions on any of those and you're interested in applying the cycle or next, please find one of those folks and, and, and um, ask. And then without further ado, I'll introduce Kathy Trolla stewart who oversees the, the therapeutic track of the Catalyst program, but also um, oversees our Metamune collaboration as well as our Center for Accelerated Innovation work with the UCCAI. Okay, thank you uh, all for coming to this. I'm hoping we're going to have a, a lively discussion, and certainly my thanks go to the panel for, for making this, uh, this work, really. Right, so my task is really just to set the scene a little bit in terms of repurposing. Um, it's a subject which evokes certain reactions from people, uh, good and bad, and um, in terms of definitions for this, um, it's actually quite difficult to find a definition because you start off with one, which is, you know, studying a compound or biologic designed to treat one disease for other diseases, and you soon work out that that really doesn't actually cover all, all types of repurposing. So maybe the, maybe the next one does, extracting added value from prior R&D investments. That sort of sums it up. It's a very financial view of it, but it does sort of sum most repurposing up. Certainly, it comes in many forms. Um, there are um, different things, different consideration for compounds which are currently still on patent to those that are off patent. Um, it matters, I think, if it's on target, as in using the same molecular target um, as the original drug uh, indication or whether it's off target and you know phenotypic assay screening is a big thing in, in repurposing um, and uh, you don't always know what your primary molecular target is in that situation so that's something that comes up too um, but it can be a new indication it can be a new route a new formulation 
or, or simply a new market. Um, and there's probably other definitions as well. Um, I don't suppose I've covered them all there. So why repurposing? Um, for me, this is an area I'm interested in. I'm particularly interested in ways that we can help and support academics um, doing really good, innovative, uh, early um, research that comes up with new targets, new approaches to disease to move forward and do drug discovery in a way that will be well received by industry and where therefore stands the chance to move forward. Repurposing is an opportunity in this space. But, it, you know, when you compare it to, to other ways of doing drug discovery, um, I think there are some very clear differences. Drug discovery per se is very high risk. It's the only area where if you start a project, you don't always get a product out of it. I think, you know, this makes it really high risk. It takes 15 years and the current data suggests to get to market should cost somewhere between four and $11 billion. This is mad. You might not win and it's gonna cost you that much and take you that long. It's intensive, it's interdisciplinary, um, and it's therefore a really tough thing for academics to do. Not impossible, but a tough one. So repurposing is seen as one way of actually um, trying to address this. And the NIH, um, National Centre for Advancing Translational Sciences, NCATS, really on board with this as a plot. Um, they have come up with a, a, a strong uh, scheme called Discovering New Therapeutic Uses for Existing Molecules. They're working with a number of big pharma companies to access their libraries and use them for different uh, indications. And they have awarded last year 12.7 million for this to nine academic centers. Interestingly, all of these projects are ones that are working directly with the industry provided compounds and there's 26 of them on that list at the moment. Not a huge number. <coughs> so I think it does, repurposing holds a lot of, a lot of opportunities. Potentially significant cost and time reduction to the clinic. It utilizes current knowledge and data on the drug. Uh, it might be human exposure data is a, is a key, key thing to add into this. There's a huge opportunity. There's a lot of drugs out there, over, uh, over a thousand registered different chemical entities. Um, and we all know they're probably useful in more than one, one disease. Doing repurposing is also seen, particularly by large pharma, as a way to review, review new molecular targets in new diseases. Um, and whereas big pharma might not take the primary compound forward, they might then um, optimise against their new targets that were revealed by a clinical study with, with, with a, uh, an older compound. There are also regulatory incentives that make this a little bit more viable, and I'm hope we'll hoping we'll discuss this a bit more. So there's lots of successful examples. These are just some of them. Uh, the one that everyone knows, Viagra, um, originally a, a cardiovascular compound with Pfizer, repurposed by Pfizer after their clinical studies uh, into erectile dysfunction, and now they're looking at, at um, a PAH as well. Uh, so that's the classic one, but it's all within pharma. Botox, really old compound actually, um, originally um, for crossed eyes and uncontrolled blinking, uh, now used very widely for cosmetics and migraine and other things. Um, again, you know, a number of compounds, a uh, number of companies involved in that. Morphine, very old compound, being repurposed in a combination uh, uh, reformulation um, by Daiichi Sanko and Charleston. Uh, or Ampira, which, which I like this one because it wasn't a drug before. It was used for other things, pesticides apparently, and now being repurposed for multiple sclerosis. So there's all sorts of different types, and I could have put lots of different examples on here, but these are just some, some known ones. So in terms of challenges, um, I think there's lots. I'm sure we'll hear about them. Um, but for me, they, they, they fit into um, four basic areas. IP, who owns what, how can you get an ownership <coughs> position in it, regulatory issues, um, different types of business model which may or may not work in, in, for repurposing, I think it is a particular uh, difference, 
and securing investment is fundamental to all of this. Truthfully, they, you can have the best drug in the world, but if it's for a small market, you're going to struggle. Securing investment is a, a key issue. So, the aim of this session is to discuss the issues, and I'm hoping that the audience will discuss as well as the, um, the panel. Um, uh, but also undermining this is that I want us to try and identify some successful strategies for repurposing um, rather than um, uh, being entirely negative. So let's, let's see if we can do this uh, and have a proper discussion about this. Um, and we'll take it from there. So Lorna is going to move on from there. Good morning. Thank you all for coming, and thanks again to our panel. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, my name is Lorna Tanner, and I'm a partner with the law firm Shepard Mullen Richter in Hampton. And I actually specialize in patents, um, particularly for life science companies. I um, help develop and prosecute uh, global IP strategies. And so I'm just since since we bought the breakfast, we get to spend a few minutes just talking about how Shepard Mullen can help you. <laughs> So this is our paid advertisement, if you will. Um, so who are we? We are a global law firm with, actually that number's old, it's actually over 600 lawyers and we have 15 office locations. Of course, the only office locations that matter are Palo Alto and San Francisco. So um, we will talk mostly about those. So. Who, we, who do we represent? Um, in Palo Alto, our clients are entrepreneurs, operating companies, emerging companies, as well as investors. And we actually handle emerging companies from cradle to grave, if you will, so we can work with you on company formation and the begin, your beginning corporate needs, as well as developing and executing your IP strategies. Um, we can also help you with mergers and acquisitions and also anything related to your rounds of financing. Um, and Kathy and I discussed, I apologize, I have way too many words on this slide, so I'll just give you the highlights. Um, so what, it, what are our specialties? Our specialties are really, you know, IP strategies for life science companies. Um, our team in Palo Alto handles a variety of technologies, ranging from small molecule pharmaceuticals, to biologics, um, as well as personalized medicine, stem cells. I mean, you name it, if you're a life science company, we've probably done a little bit of work in your area and can help you. Um, we also have expertise with uh, clinical trial agreements, um, all, all sorts of IP transactional agreements, as well as FDA regulatory laws. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the panel to introduce themselves, and maybe we'll go left to right and start with Brian. I'm uh, Brian Atwood. I'm a uh, co-founder of Versa Ventures, and um, uh, the firm, just to start off with that, has been in existence since uh, 1999. Um, Can we kill the slides oh, yeah. while we're talking? <laughs> right, it's right, right there. Um, and uh, in that time, we've raised about $2 billion. The, um, uh, the number of companies that we've started between the five funds that represent those $2 billion is about 120, 130. We still have about 80 or so under management uh, within the funds. The, um, uh, the primary business of the, of the firm, uh, actually the only business of the firm, has been healthcare. So about half medical devices, half um, uh, biotechnology. Um, and uh, we like to start companies at the uh, very beginning. We're not later stage investors, uh, by and large. Um, so uh, I like to say it's usually two entrepreneurs and no business plan is, is where we get involved with uh, almost all of our companies. Um, and that kind of reflects the, uh, the nature of the um, folks who put the firm together. We're all entrepreneurs, um, every one of us. And so we kind of like starting things and working with entrepreneurs and doing entrepreneurial things. Um, I've been in the biotech business since 1980. Um, I started off with a very small firm back in um, Massachusetts called Collaborative Research. Um, and then um, after that, I uh, was at Cetus Corporation in uh, Berkeley and Emeryville for several years. I was involved in the founding of the PCR business. Uh, and then after that, started a company called Glycomed um, in 1987, uh, took it public, and then sold it in 1994. Five to uh, to a uh, San Diego company, Ligand Pharmaceuticals, and then uh, joined the the dark side in venture. <laughs> I'm Willie Quinn. I'm CEO of Bullet Biotechnology, and uh, for the last three years, I've been working to develop immunotherapy, uh, predominantly for cancer, and we're also looking at autoimmune disease. 
So I'm out of the repurposing world now, but I think the reason I'm on the panel is I was at Jazz Pharmaceuticals for more than eight years. And when I joined the company, the vision that was articulated was we were going to take known compounds with known mechanisms of action, couple those with proven drug delivery technology and come up with these amazing drugs which were lower risk because we knew they would work and they would meet unmet needs. So we'd focus on the unmet needs of the marketplace and the patient, go out and license best of breed technology, find the right drug, put it together. And uh, so I looked at a lot of assets that fall into the category of what we're talking about today. Uh, amazingly, if you look at Jazz today, um, very successful, um, but the products that brought it success really weren't the pipeline products that we were developing with this model. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting um, experience, and we'll talk more about it later. And um, I'm Ellen Hartram, and I'm from Gilead Sciences, and I used to be your neighbor because I was in mm -hmm. CVT, and Jazz was right next door to CVT in Palo, so you had very pretty trees. <laughs> and uh, so I was part, I started out in a small IP boutique firm when, uh, way back at the dawn of time. And then I was with Lorna uh, when we worked for Jerry Swiss at uh, Burnstone. And then I went in-house at CV Therapeutics. That was a cardiovascular company uh, that was uh, later acquired by Gilead in 2009, and I've been with Gilead ever since. Uh, I currently head up the prosecution group, so I also uh, direct the review of all of our BD work that we're doing, the IP analysis of our BD work, and uh, we look at a lot of different things. And we've also done at very points, various points in my career in, in uh, both at CBT and in Gilead, we've, we've repurposed things and looked at repurposing things. So I do have some experience both on the development side of that and on the, and on the potential acquisition side of that, so. Hello, good morning. My name is Cyril Ducol. Um, I am the co-founder and president of a startup company called Neurogastrix based in the Bay Area. Um, repurposing is very important to us. <clears throat> um, my company is targeting uh, gastrointestinal uh, disorders. Um, the, the lead compound that we have is uh, uh, aimed at a disease called gastroparesis, um, which is essentially a paralysis of the stomach. Um, the disease has been around for a long time, obviously, but there is only one compound available in the U.S. for the treatment of this disease um, called metoclopramide. Um, with a black box warning and, and terrible side effects. And that's essentially the only solution that gastroenterologists have today for these patients. Um, so we are proposing to find uh, a safer alternative to metoclopramide and replace it in the US market. Um, so I think repurposing becomes you know, really important um, for this type of projects because um, safety is paramount in this type of exercise if you're trying to, to replace a molecule for safety concerns. Um, so working with molecules that already have um, a, a known safety profile is really important. We'll talk about you know, the trade-off um, for that. Um, <clears throat> prior to founding Neurogastrix, I was a consultant uh, for the pharma industry and I've been working on a number of projects that were also um, repurposed, repurposed drugs, um, notably a uh, small molecule therapeutics for an orphan neuro neurological indication. Um, and prior to that, I was working uh, at Jazz Pharmaceuticals as well with uh, Willie. And as Willie said, you know, there were a number of projects that we looked at that were um, uh, repurposed drugs as well. Um, and I've worked in, uh, hand in hand with Willie with these projects. And I've also uh, worked on the clinical development of um, an, an intranasal reformulation of a, um, a generic benzodiazepine uh, for a while. So that's another example of uh, a repurposed drug that, that I worked on in the past. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, good morning, my name is Ken Horn. I'm the CEO of Simic Biomedical. Uh, we are a preclinical stage venture-backed uh, platform therapeutic developing a library of proteoglycans. Uh, we're located at QB3 at 953, so I feel like part of the family here. Um, 
for us, uh, you know, all of our assets are still preclinical, so it's not repurposing is not a problem for today. It's a problem for tomorrow because of our library has multiple different indications with the same molecule. We have to think about what indications first and what indication follows that. So repurposing is more of a future issue. But uh, as any smart company should do, you should think about those problems today. Uh, prior to Simic Biomedical, I uh, I was a VC, so I'm recovering from the dark side, and so far it's going pretty well. Um, and as part of that, that's where I first met Lorna, and we looked at multiple assets that were repurposed drugs. So I think um, we're able to look at the issues from you know the, the investor side of the table. And uh, and separate from that, I also started a, a, a business development company licensing assets from the West to um, Russia and Eastern Europe, and most of that was repurposed drugs. So. Um, from that perspective, it was more of a business <coughs> development perspective, so I feel like I've gotten to sit on all sides of the table here. And um, uh, thank you for inviting me, Lorna. Sure. So um, again, this is meant to be an interactive discussion, so I'll probably kick it off with a few questions to the panel, but feel free. I believe that Terry has a mic in the back, so um, again, we really encourage audience participation, but I think... Um, since maybe, <coughs> since Ken, you've looked at this from all sides. Maybe maybe you could talk about what what are some of your biggest challenges when you're looking at repurposing, at least from a business model perspective. Um, sure. So, uh, given the rest of the panel here, perhaps I'll start with um, with clinical outcomes. So, if you're going after disparate clinical indications, and again, the assumption here is that you're one company and you have multiple indications that you're going after, but um, you know, if you've got a, even if it's a different company, if you have one indication that you're going after that has high risk patients that, you know, they're going to be bad outcomes, right? Some patients are just going to die no matter what, no matter if, even if you have the perfect drug. And then you're going after a lesser risk patient population. If that same drug kills patients with that indication and you're using it over here to smooth wrinkles, you're going to have to talk about those patients that died, right? <laughs> so, you know, maybe, you know, Mrs. Jones looks better, but she's going to have to read this black box, maybe not black box, a warning that says you might die, right? Um, so that's something you should consider about your clinical uh, indications. And then um, the other area, perhaps this can incite some conversation, is about is about reimbursement and pricing. Um, and a, a vast and Lucentis, Lucentis, if there are any Genentech uh, alumni in the room here, is a classic example of something that was priced, was it three, three orders of magnitude, two orders of magnitude, whatever. One injection, Lucentis, was $1,500, <coughs> and Avastin was, you know, $50. Right, one was approved on label and one was being used off label. So the the lesson to be learned there is if you have one market that you're going after that you can charge a high dollar value for that product, like an orphan disease, for example, and then you want to go after something afterwards where it's being charged an order of magnitude or even more or less, at some point the doctors are going to revolt, like they did with Avastin. And so you need to be cognizant about pricing strategies, um, you know, about how you're going to price your your drug on the market. Well, maybe we won't talk that much about pricing with Gilead. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> can, I, can I jump in quickly? Please, yeah. So, so the one thing that I would say is I think a lot of what you're talking about, I would actually characterize as life cycle management mm -hmm. um, and deciding which indications to go after first and pricing strategies and things like that are important, but that's part of every drug development program. and. I think the, the challenge in repurposing is often you find an opportunity that someone else has developed. And it could be a development that stalled out. It could be only approved in France for a very narrow indication 30 years ago. It's something that you know someone found a gem and then left it on the side of the road. And you're trying to figure out, does it make sense to pick it up and use it for something else? So I think it's a little different. I mean, all those issues are very important. Um, and to the extent that it's on the market for something else, um, you have to worry about substitution and pricing and all kinds of things. But I think repurposing is a little different, mm -hmm. when I think about it at least. It's a little more of the fringe cases of um, someone else did it, if I'm repurposing my own drug, I think of that as life cycle management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so, Molly, I'd like to add to what you said. I completely agree with you. I think that that's more life cycle management, life cycle extension, label extension, and all that stuff. But, but, um, but I 
think it's also, I mean, it's someone else uh, did it and left it on the side of the road as one scenario, but sometimes someone else is doing it in a different indication and may not have covered it in their patent for this new indication that you have some early evidence for. And, you know, what makes that an attractive thing for that someone else who currently owns that? And, you know, an example would be at um, you know Genentech, so initially Rituxan was uh, was developed for uh, a malignancy, and their life cycle extension has been in rheumatoid arthritis and in vasculitis, and both of those came out of investigator sponsored trials and and the, and the data that was that came from those things and. And I believe that the investigators that actually led those early phase studies that provided data that allowed Genentech to move forward on those new indications did not have any financial stakes before, after, during, or after. So, you know, so I think, you know, all of those things are really, would be really interesting to sort of get your insights on as to how you leverage that kind of early data that an academic might generate towards something that, um, you know, they, that, that can come back either to the university and or, I mean, just getting interest from the company who can actually move it along is also a huge accomplishment. But if we can convert that to not just interest, but financial return, that would be even better. <laughs> So, so let me uh, dive in. Um, uh, about 10 years ago, a good friend of mine, Roger Longman, uh, who used to be a, a very important part of this industry, is, is now an entrepreneur um, actually in the service side of the healthcare industry, um, used to be a, a publisher and, an, and a writer um, of a group of publications, the most important of which was in vivo. And, and one of the things that Roger liked to do was, was to present about how the industry works. He was a, a great student of the industry. And one of his uh, f uh, most fun presentations was um, a history of repurposing, if you will. He didn't call it that, but he talked about it. Um, and it was, a, it was a group of about six or seven drugs that had, in, in, in my metaphor, been like ancient mariners uh, that had just kind of traversed the industry from one company to another, all, all large pharmaceuticals companies and and the story was that until serendipity happened uh, those drugs were lost souls um, uh, and and that's that's kind of what repurposing is except that now we're trying to systematize that process and 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 the systematization of that process is hard um, because what you're really saying is how do I make serendipity happen yeah, you don't make serendipity happen so you go back to the Viagra example and you think about how that happened and we all know the story um, and it's fun, fundamentally one person or a group of people who said, hey, there's something happening here. Um, and if you go back to Roger's history, what happened was people weren't doing that. It was bureaucracies or committees or people were not paying attention or they weren't using all of their IQ, but whatever, they weren't doing their job. They weren't paying attention and trying to trying to get that little tweak of insight. So so I think the, the interesting thing about repurposing it, it uh, drugs, if you're trying to systematize it, is how do I um, really use everything at my disposal to create insight. Um, and there are lots of tools to do that. Certainly genomics helps and high throughput drug screening helps and all of that other stuff. But fundamentally, it's still how smart am I and how smart is my team to say that drug could be used for this indication instead of where it's been failing for the last two or five or ten years. I uh, wanted to ask a question about, not necessarily just for the lawyers, but how do you get around patent expiration for old, if the drug's being repurposed, it may have been licensed already for a different indication. But if, for example, raloxifene failed for breast cancer, for breast cancer treatment, shelved, brought back for bone, but it's a marvelous drug for breast cancer risk reduction, but Lilly couldn't pursue that. Um, how do you get around those kinds of obstacles with repurposing? Well, I'll jump in on this one. If somebody's got a patent, you get a license. That's, that's pretty much the way it goes. Or you wait it out. Um, you look at the expiry and you see how long it's going to be in clinical trials. You're pretty much within safe harbor for all of that. So as long as you're not going to enter the market until after the, the application goes, the, the patent expires, you you should be okay to develop, but 
you're going to need a license if you're going to try to get on the market while that patent's in place. Uh, it might be a good opportunity for you to try to partner with the innovator who holds the license, who holds the actual patent. But I, I think when we're when we're talking about all of this repurposing, we really need to break it down into a bit more of a framework because we've got different classes of compounds here that we're thinking about. Okay, we have your example, which is a compound that is already on the market or it has been developed for something that has current patent protection, and you're trying to come up with a different use for it. So that's actually probably the hardest sell, but the safest sell, because you already have your safety data. It's already on the market. You have a lot you can work on. However, you're in an area where you've got somebody who has stakes in the ground. So maneuvering in that area, you want to work with your innovator. You want to try to see if you can get them to help you out with the clinical trial, if you can uh, get involved in some kind of sponsored research agreement, something like that. And, and when you're working in that area, your best, your best opportunity is to sell them on the science. Come to, come to your innovator with a good science story that, that, that really makes sense, and that will be very persuasive. Um, but they're going to be a little sensitive about doing things, because if you have a drug that's on the market and you let someone go off and play with it, I mean, of course, if it's commercially available, you can go off and play with it on your own. I'm assuming you're wanting funding to help you with this development. Um, and something negative turns up, we're going to have to report that to the FDA. So that's going to make us a little bit leery of letting you play in something very dangerous that we don't think has supportable results. Well, it makes us leery of funding you to play with something dangerous. You can do what you like with your own money and time. But um, So there's that class of compound. Then there's the, the, on the opposite end of the spectrum is the old and cold. So it was out there. People knew about it for a long time. It was a, we, we recently uh, took a look at something that had been a drug that's been known since the 1940s. <laughs> and um, someone came up with a new idea. And, and all of this is science-based, so really I can't hammer home the science enough. That is your bedrock, is the science. Tricky won't get you places, science will get you places. So they figured out the new the mechanism, or at least a, a plausible reason for behind the mechanism, something new that no one had thought about, that gives you a whole new area of opportunity to, to invest and explore and to market. Uh, it was a very tempting thing, but we needed we need more science to understand that. So that's kind of the those are the two polar spectrums, old and cold with new spanky exciting science, and currently developed and out on the market, and you want to try to new tweak things. In the middle of those two, you have the very blurry area of almosts, almosts with some kind of patent protection involved. So when you're working in those kinds of areas, uh, the tempting things to try to do are, oh, it's a new formulation, or oh, it's a new drug delivery system. And that, it has possibilities, but it's not as attractive to us as in its large pharma because they're, so if you come at something with a new, sorry, I'm talking a lot, aren't I? I'm sorry, I talk a lot. Um, <laughs> if you come at something with a new uh, tweak based on the existing mechanism of action, so you're playing around in the same sort of therapeutic space, probably not a great sell because it's, it's, you're going to have inherency issues, you're going to have all kinds of things, it's going to be a little bit of a murkier, murkier path for you. Um, if you're coming at it with a new drug delivery system, that can work. But something you might not be realizing or thinking about from a regulatory perspective is if you go in and you get a new, uh, 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 an SNDA based on a new formulation, that doesn't have the same ANDA protections that you would get with a new NCE. With a brand new NCE, you get four years before somebody can even file an ANDA application. If you're coming at it with an, with an SNDA, they can file immediately. So you don't have those four happy years of exclusivity if you're just coming at it with it. And that actually does play a part when we look at things from a, from a, perspective, from a litigation perspective when we're evaluating things. We have to think about that. Um, so really, it, when you're thinking about what you're going to do with repurposing, try to bear in mind the class of compound and where you are in the development, because I think that will inform your choices a great deal and what you bring forward. Can I jump in just, just to step back a second? IP is super important, and people will talk about it a lot, but at the end of the day, the calculation everyone's making is how much does it cost to develop the drug, and then how much are you going to make? And the how much are you going to make depends quite heavily on how much exclusivity you have. And it's not only patent protection, but it's the regulatory protection. So if it's a biologic, for example, <clears throat> maybe you don't worry about that as much because you True. get a, a long life, right? 
But um, what we found at Jazz when we did financial modeling is three years is even in kind of optimistic scenarios is generally not enough to pay back your investment. So you get three years of new dosage form exclusivity just for having a, a new formulation or a new dosage. And that's generally not enough. Five years of NCE um, usually is, um, even if you don't have a patent, but it depends on the, the market assumptions and how well you can do commercially. And so it's a combination of what's the true need in the marketplace? You know, are you gonna be able to sell a product that patients value and payers pay for? Um, how long can you sell that for? You know, are there substitutes? Is there patent challenges? Uh, and all of that then impacts the attractiveness for investment. And if you can't raise money to do it, then you can't do it. So, For that uh, five years, also, if you're thinking about a new indication, go for your orphan drugs, because that gets you seven. Seven's, seven's, good. seven's good. Seven is good. And in that time, you can come up with other strategies. So Jazz is a classic example with Zyram. When we um, initially acquired Orphan Medical, Zyram was on the market. It was under Orphan Drug Exclusivity, and they actually had no Orange Book listed patents. And today, if you look at the um, listing for Zyram, I think it's upwards of 12, and the, the longest lived one goes out to 2033. So there, once you get on the market and you get a reasonable sized product, there's a lot you can do to perpetuate the life. But. A question in the back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Nancy Mize and CEO of Genogen, and we have a company that's repurposed a biologic. And the patents go off in 2017. And we've done a proof of concept clinical study. We're gearing up to do our first uh, clinical study with a new indication. And we have patents on the new formulation, the new indication, all that. But so our problem right now is supply. Do we make it ourselves? Is that the easiest? I mean, we're, we're talking to the company that makes it to try to get a license, but I want to have some leverage. If you could comment on supply, that would be helpful. Supply issues in the biologics can be very tricky uh, because I don't know the, the, your current manufacturer. So, so you're playing around with somebody else's biologic, and they have a system involved. So, you're going to need to get tech transfer from them unless you're going to optimize your own system. So, it's a considerable investment to set up a biologics manufacturing facility. I, I, I don't know what your financials are like, but but bear in mind that that's a considerable time and investment kind of a deal. It's we we struggle for space ourselves for for, for biologics processing. Um, I think whatever uh, run your numbers and whatever works well for you. I don't know that any one is more advantageous than the other. I mean, if you're working with the CRO or the current, I'm sorry, I'm thinking out loud. Um, just my own gut thing. I, I don't want to advise you. I'm sorry. I, I feel bad giving you advice on on something that. Um, I just run the numbers and see what works best for you. It sounds like a good problem to have, um, yeah, exactly. as opposed to you know <laughs> fundraising uh, or IP. But I don't think we know enough to tell you um, if you go with the originator. There's potential conflicts, and it might be a challenging negotiation. And it, there's a lot of attraction to controlling your own destiny, but. Then, um, if you go down that route, you're having to go through uh, a new process with the FDA and get that validated and approved. And if you could get a DMF, you know, a, ma a master file towards the other production that's already ha approved, that might be better from a risk perspective. But it's just trading off different risks. So I don't know enough about your situation. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's making a biosimilar. In. Yes, I would like to follow up on the previous uh, discussion. Uh, fundraising for uh, for for uh, repurposing projects with really small markets. I'm talking about like one million dollar in sales. Uh, taking account, I mean, like using average prices, not premium pricing. So, how do you fundraise for the regu regulatory studies? It's not a lot, maybe 
two or three million dollars, but still you got to get over that. And the it's not uh, as my, my understanding not of interest to commercial investors. Uh, so, have, do you have thoughts on patient sourcing? Or, I mean, any business models that can support this kind of development? So maybe Cyril or Ken, since I know you guys are in the throes of financing, could. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> I, yeah, I mean, I can attest that, you know, funding is difficult no matter what. Uh, these repurposing efforts, you know, I've worked on a number of them. Uh, they're pretty unique. Uh, they have their own set of uh, promises and challenges, uh, pitfalls. Um, and you have to package it and present it to investors uh, in a way that makes sense and, you know, you get passionate about it. Um, but at the end of the day, they crunch the numbers and either it works or it doesn't. Um, aside from the traditional VC route, uh, we found that um, talking to angel investors, you know, individual investors, they're also passionate about what you're doing is a lot easier. Um, obviously, they're not investing in the same range, um, dollar range, that is. So you need a lot of them. Um, that, that can be uh, exhausting um, and time consuming. Uh, but unfortunately, when the, when the VCs don't believe in your project, you have to fund it some other ways. Um, other than that, I would, of course, you know, suggest uh, non-dilutive funding, such as grants and um, you know, different associations and non-profit organizations that could give you a leg up. Um, other than that, I guess it's your own money. <laughs> Yeah, and I'd, I'd agree with that. I think, um, you know, you have to be scrappier these days than before. Uh, you know, Brian can speak to this better. I feel like from my perspective, um, you know, the people, the few that remain that are doing early stage stuff, the VCs are looking for bigger opportunities as opposed to safer stuff. Um, that's, again, my humble perspective. So I think for us, it's been, um, you know, cautiously optimistic that the VC appetite for my company has been okay. I think if you've got a smaller project that you're trying to do, I think you do need to find non-VC sources of capital to kind of get, get some momentum. Uh, the, you know, the VCs can say no, but they don't say no for in perpetuity, right? They can always say yes later. That's the advantage they have. So if you have some angel capital, you know, you get a method of use claim on your patent, um, you, you know, uh, the, the other suggestion I was telling Cyril earlier, if you have a relatively niche thing you're going after, it matters to someone, right? Those doctors that are doing that or those patients, it matters to someone. <coughs> so find that group, whether it's the doctors or the patients or both, um, and get them to invest or get them to support you. Um, you know, doctors, most of them got a lot of money, right? So they can probably write a fifty to $100,000 check and, you know, maybe they don't get to buy a new Tesla next week, but <laughs> they, they'll probably get more of a kick out of this. And in my first round as majority doctors, they looked at this like philanthropy with maybe some upside. Uh, that's the way they invested in us. And Brian, if you wanted to comment from the VC perspective. Well, I, I really can't add a lot to that. It's um, the, the VC business has gone through a really, really hard time over the last 10 years, actually about 12 years. Um, and uh, funding is hard for you guys. Funding is really hard for us. Um, and so my firm took a little over three years to raise its latest fund um, and basically turned over its entire investment base in order to do that. So it's, it's, just, it's just historically bad. Um, and what's that turned into is, is uh, first of all, a smaller investor group, which hurts you guys, hurts us as well, because there's less of an ecosystem for sharing investments. Um, uh, but it's also, um, which is good, refocus the brains of venture investors to be way, way more focused on um, quicker exits and bigger exits. Um, so the good news there from a repurposing point of view is um, the things that people have mentioned earlier, you've got a lot of stuff behind you. You've got safety hopefully behind you. You've got the actual discovery of the molecule, a bunch of things like that. So millions, maybe tens of millions of dollars behind you. So you're a lot shorter to exit. Um, but, but you know, just in summary, traditional venture investors, which are probably 20 or 25 now instead of 50 or 60 like 10 years ago, um, they're pretty much looking for really big exits. Um, with little amounts of money in, which uh, sounds hard and impossible, but that's what everybody's doing right now. Is there a question in the middle? Yeah, uh, my question was about the old and cold. So I, I don't know much about how all this, a lot of the, the words you're using make sense sort of <laughs> alone, but I, I don't quite understand all of it. So so for the old and cold, if it's, if it's gone off patent, if there's a compound and you have this new idea that it might work in some new, new uh, indication, how does that work? How, how does the IP work? Like, 
you get a use patent like how, how, how does that yeah that's what you do you would you would go and you would do a use patent when we've seen this happen uh, in because usually it's academicians who's doing who are doing this they'll go around they'll play a little bit they'll find a compound they'll think they'll try to they'll try to figure out why it did what they what people said it did you know 60 years ago when they didn't have the science to really look at the biology of, of what was going on so they'll play around in it and while they're playing around in it they'll see something they'll see a pathway they'll see that it hits something they'll see some other side effect that wasn't detectable before with the existing science and based on that they'll make a supposition or a hypothesis about what else it could be doing and then they'll try to come up with assays that will test it usually it's a conventional assay that they modify a little bit and then they may even make a little they'll grab somebody from chem lab and they'll maybe they'll do a little med chem around it and come up with a few analogs depending because usually the if it's an old compound the synthesis is publicly available and everybody knows how to make it and you just have to tinker with it a little bit and they'll try to get some kind of method case around it uh, if the if the mechanism is is sufficiently distinct enough from what people thought were happening before and the indication base is dis sufficiently desperate so you won't have inherency going on um, you know because so say before they were treating using it for treating diabetes and now you're tripping into something else that's oncology it's totally not related you wouldn't necessarily have any overlap there um, then you can get your method claims and then you have to get through the whole the dosing whatever they were doing before uh, you can bet if you have new science figuring it out there's probably a whole different PK thing going on but that kind of information though usually comes up later in the clinical trials so you know you take a broad guess on what you think you need in the dosing range and you throw it in your spec and you hope for the best but when you really get the data on what your dose level is going to be then you try to get more PK data around it so uh, case in point renalazine wonderful go ran renalazine renalazine was uh, syntax I don't know many of you remember syntax but it was if you ever take a leave that's syntax and it was one of the huge huge drug companies in the Bay Area and uh, they were investigating renalazine and they were looking for a calcium channel blocker if you look at the drug it's designed clearly to be a calcium channel blocker unfortunately it failed miserably as a calcium channel blocker and they believed there were scientists there who believed in it and they kept poking around in it however when Roche came in and bought Syntex the belief was not there and so they shut it down the whole thing down that's actually a very ripe area for you guys to look at we look at look at companies post acquisition because usually what happens is large farmer will take that portfolio and they will go through and they go no yes no yes this we're not interested in this and those are opportunities for you to go in and see if you can poach stuff that, that got is getting left on the wayside it's just not in our clinical area oh my god we'd need a whole new sales force for that the clinical trials will be 500 years long we're just not doing it those are ripe areas so in in the case of renalazine um, Roche just had no interest in it because it wasn't going to work the way they thought it was supposed to work and well, the product champion and the product left champion the left the company and he went to work at CV therapeutics who had had a total crash and burn of their drug that they were trying to do and we were going oh no we don't have anything we're going out of business so we he said you know hey wait a minute you guys wait 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 I got this drug so we went and licensed it and it took a long time long long time and a lot of science because it turned out the, the obviously it's not a calcium channel blocker how is it treating angina that's what it's for by the way treating angina um, long time lots of science we figured out the actual mechanism and that was completely new now we couldn't get IP on it, much to our scientists chagrin trying to explain that to a, a chem to a, a real hardcore scientist that you know great that you figured out but you know what can't get mechanism claims uh, they don't like to hear that but uh, it does open up new indications so we got it we pushed it forward it's been on the market but it did open up that whole new area so the IP that we have on it when we finally got it approved we had like six months of patent term extension available the patents had actually the regular term of the patent had already expired and we were filing interim patent term extensions on the compound so six months after we were on the market we had no compound protection at all the only thing we had covering that drug the only thing we still have are PK based claims based on the dosing regimen and what was necessary in vivo to have the effect that we needed 
and some very tricky formulation claims that uh, because it has a very nasty absorption profile. So that kind of thing can save the day. That's where formulation and PK kind of claims can get you for repurposing of a drug that's further down the road. We have other drugs, so Ambersen, which is our um, uh, PAH drug. Okay, the old joke is if you have a, you make a chemical and you throw it on the grass, if it kills the grass, it's a pesticide. If the grass grows, it's a, it's a fertilizer. So Ambersen actually was a pesticide. If you read the original compound patents, BASF came up with it in Germany, and it's a pesticide. It also, so that's a classic repurposing as well that where we, we went through, but it's all about the dosing, it's all about the PK, it's all about the indication being separate enough and being able to extend. And that's an orphan drug too, so we got seven years on that one, which was awesome. And so maybe you could comment generally, Ellen, about the value of non-composition of matter patents. If that's all you got, they're worth a lot. <laughs> that's really what it is. If it's the only indication a method came can be just as valuable as, this is US centric, okay. If you all have the method claims and that's the only approved indication, that's worth something. Um, outside the US, you're going to want to do secondary medical use kind of claims, but those can also have value as well. So it, it can be valuable. Now if you're, if it's, if it's the new and fresh compound that's already in development and you're doing a follow-on indication, those method claims, not going to get you anywhere. So renalazine, case in point. Um, we had it for angina. We've discovered during our clinical trials that it also had this marvelous effect on HbA1c. So it's actually an anti -di It has a very strong anti-diabetic effect. We followed follow-on IP on that, which has a later date. Um, and we, <coughs> thanks to Lorna's good care, we actually did finally get that damn thing allowed. But um, seven years in the making. Yeah, it was it was brutal. But really, what is the value of that IP? Because the minute our sustained release formulation for, for angina goes off market, our claims for, for diabetes are tissue paper thin. I mean, they'll just, the generics will just get approval for the angina indication, it won't do you anything. So if you're the only method, if you're the only indication, then those method claims have value. Otherwise, eh. Is there a question in the back yeah. here? Can you comment somewhat um, from a clinician's perspective? Over here, sorry. <laughs> from a clinician's perspective, if you've made an observation, so for example, I'll give kind of a real life scenario. Propranolol, which was commonly used in the cardiac setting for blood pressure control and, and rhythm disturbance, rate disturbance, was found to be a um, significant drug for the treatment of hemangioma of, in, of infancy. Uh, so it leads to a, a regression or an involution of these tumors in childhood. If you're the clinician who may have made that observation, what's your next step to approach either a drug company or um, a team of researchers to try to find out what is the science behind that so then you can seek some sort of repurposing of that drug for that new purpose? So when we've had that happen, and we have had that happen, uh, what the uh, our intrepid physicians did, clinicians did, is first they, no dummies them, ran off and filed a patent application. <laughs> Um, covering, basing, using whatever clinical data they had, whatever they had done. It was a thin application, but it was an application, no doubt. And then they took that happy application and they wrote us a letter and say, hey, look what I figured out. Look what I noticed. Can I work with you on this? And it put them in a very nice spot. They had something, not anything great, but clearly it was someone to work with, someone who had an interest that would drive it forward. So. That would, that would be my, and then we went into a sponsored research agreement with them and we helped fund their research and we moved it forward. It ended up not panning out, but you know. And what about from a startup company perspective, Cyril or Ken? Well, let me jump in while they're thinking. I mean, <laughs> uh, the, I think the biggest challenge is how do you um, capture that value? And if someone else is selling it for another indication, um, it's going to be difficult unless they agree to work with you. So if you file IP and you go to them and they opt in, then you're in a good position. Trying to do something on your own is going to be very challenging. And, and so then the question becomes, are you trying to create financial gain or are you trying to help patients just philanthropically for the good of the patient? And in that case, you know, you could publish it and you know if the drug's already out there and used then you know docs can use it however they like but it it is a challenging situation to navigate devils in the details 
Yeah. At least from an IP attorney's perspective, since we're now in this first to file world, I think taking a, a stab at filing a patent application before you begin those discussions is probably a wise move. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd add to that. I mean, these things don't happen by accident. So, you know, you got to really care. And I think if you really care, whether it's for clinical reasons or financial reasons, talking to someone smart like a Lorna and saying, okay, can we file IP here or not, I, I think is a good thing. And, and to Will's point and William's point, you know, if you're, if you're really trying to drive this thing forward, you know, the, the investor and even big farmer, I think, will be more receptive if you have some optionality that you can present, not, not for them, but for yourself, right? Which is like, look, you know, we'd like to work with you, but even if we don't, if you don't come say yes to us now, I've got this NIH grant going and, you know, we're going to find this way forward. As a former investor, I'm going to, you know, I, I, I listen to that, right? And I might say no, because if you work out well a year from now in your phase two SBIR or whatever, you'll come back and I'll get a chance to say yes then. But you know, net net, I, don't, I think it's better to have some options that you can prevent, present about yourself about how you're taking this forward because it shows that, you know, somehow or another you're going to find a way to get this done. But the specific case here, propanolol makes it hard, right? Because that's really generic. Yeah. So there's no mothership to go talk yeah. to. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and if you file and it gets published, I guess there's a way to conduct that. But, but then you're just telling the generic world, well, you can whisper about this application. So, so yeah. it's, you know, this particular case is uh, yeah. hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can file and then you can pull it before you know, just not convert, and then it'll it'll disappear into the abyss. But um, have your target in mind who you want to go talk to. And the NIH, that I mean, that kind of thing, they would I think they would be interested in. That's it's for the good of the world. So. It, um, I, I wanted to address that propanolol uh, uh, question uh, in a different perspective uh, from both a regulatory and a payer perspective. In, in the case of repurposing an, a generic drug, say a new indication, we have now, of course, this carve out for the generic. So, the, so there's two labels. There's the generic label on the market that contains all of the old indications, and now the repurposed indication is in it has, what, three years exclusivity, that's it, at the mm -hmm. time of approval. The problem is, though, is that the payers are ignoring the labels. They're just going to go ahead and buy the generic drug and uh, dispense it for the new indication. And so the, the company that made the investment in developing that generic drug, repurposed that generic drug, got the exclusivity, is essentially being ignored. So I'm just wondering um, if the panel's perspective, are there any <laughs> things that are going on in that space? Uh, is, it, is it, for example, um, is it possible to keep the payers honest on, 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 on the use of these things? No. <laughs> <laughs> so there's nothing going on. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I just for fun, I looked up some some numbers coming into this, and and one that comes to mind and, and is relevant to the parenteral discussion too is some axons Silenor, where they got doxepin approved for sleep, and doxepin's a very very old compound already on the market, and the problem um, doesn't become maintaining your patent as much as substitution. So doctors would just use you know, they've, they've now been shown that you can use low-dose doxepin. And the company was trying to rely on the fact that typically um, the lowest dose is a 10 milligram capsule and you can't divide it, but there's also liquid available. And so it was, the numbers that I looked up, there were 280 million in paid-in capital to Samaxin. And um, the peak sales before they were sold was 16 million a year. So those, you, we already know those numbers don't work, even if, you, <laughs> even if you have 10 years of exclusivity. And then they sold the company for 25 million. So the other challenge here is you have some very bad precedents where there was this irrational exuberance around repurposing, I would say about 12 years ago, maybe a little more. And a lot of it didn't work out so well. So, so it makes it more difficult to be successful. Just a follow-up question: uh, uh, Are any of you aware of any activity going on in Washington, uh, given the fact that uh, you know repurposing provides uh, you know some real benefits to the healthcare system in terms of you know already approved drugs for new uses and so on? 
given the three years exclusivity limitation, uh, is there anything going on in Washington, like with pharma or any lobbying going on to get Congress to maybe um, write some legislation that would uh, encourage more repurposing? Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Not that I know of. I think they'd rather fund a study with some NIH dollars and then publish it and everyone uses a generic, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just following up on that, I think, you know, when, when NCAT set up their camp, um, that was absolutely their intention, was, was to, to start some of them discussions off. Um, as far as I can tell, they haven't had an awful lot of success. Um, and most of the work of the NCATs in this space, as I've said, is around using uh, proprietary um, pharma um, libraries to find other, other uses for those pharma's drugs uh, in, 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 in collaboration with the drug, drug companies. Um, so it's interesting to see how this goes. I mean, personally, I think, you know, it, it's a good thing. Um, and we need, we, we need the regulators, um, et cetera, to help, help us find ways that make sense. But I don't see it happening at the moment. Any comments, please add. Oh, question. June has a question. So just a, a comment on the repurposing program that the NIH is running, or EDCATS is, is running. Um, the, you, you probably have all read the press on it, but a number of companies have, have signed on, and they've made a very limited number of compounds from their vault available. And some of the restrictions, but some of those, some of those companies have, have been that you can only pursue indications that are orthogonal to anything that they have pers are pursuing or have thought of, <laughs> and so it really and, and then and then you know there's lots of and then um, in terms of how those programs are set up, there's very limited support for the projects that they choose, um, and so you know they they promise to provide some drugs so you can actually do the clinical studies. They provide limited preclinical data. But really, uh, you know, the, the whole, the preclinical package isn't really necessarily available to you to be able to adequately plan your development program. So that's, that's a bit of a challenge. But I think the bigger challenge is they're, al they're, they're, um, they're allowing the use of their drug and they're, uh, they're uh, promising clinical supply so you can do the studies, but really very little other support. And, and once you get into the clinics, the kinds of support you need um, to actually, the, the, the scale of support you need to actually conduct a clinical study, even a proof of concept study, is pretty substantial, not one that's e easily accessible in the academic environment. So, you know, Ellen, you alluded to, um, you know, engaging with those, those uh, uh, private companies to see if you can gain their interest to do it, to, to be more engaged. But actually engaging those comp the companies that actually own the molecules have been more challenging than one might imagine for a, for a lot of reasons. So, so it would be really good to... Well, so you're talking, you have to distinguish between coming directly to the company and going to, for, to an independent research grant and having an interesting thing and uh, having... A, a true intellectual discussion with with the research team. There's that route, and then there's the whole NIH government intervention thing. So I spend a, a fair amount of time going over CRADA agreements, and I got to tell you, those government agreements are awful from a from an innovator perspective. They're just awful, and they're very intransigent, and they won't negotiate with you, and there's no flexibility in it. And so when you come at it, unfortunately, when you come at it through that kind of institutional angle we're much less receptive because it's both actually it's both i think you know i think some i think some companies are more res more um more open than others but lots of companies for all of the reasons that you um articulated earlier regarding uh safety findings that might mm -hmm. that might creep up in a different indication in a study that's not controlled by the company where you might or might not believe the the safety finding uh, for a lot of reasons there but you know I think it would be um, it would be it would be really useful to get some insight as to what venues within a company is appropriate to pursue and we've done that with a lot of different companies 
going through the investigator-sponsored trial mechanism or talking directly with the therapeutic area um, decision makers to, 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 to get, or, or product uh, leaders to actually, to, to be interested. But it would be really interesting, interested to know what the different venues are that might be pursued. Well, you also keep in mind that just because uh, we're less, we're more reluctant to work with our crown jewel that's on the market and something else, doesn't mean that we don't have three or four backup compounds with the same mechanism that we would be interested in playing with because a different drug and a different indication, that, that has a lot of opportunities. So once again, if you've got great science and you've got a real reason, we might want to just take a different drug from our library and, and move that forward. So you ask about what other venues there are. Other than the in investigator-sponsored research agreements, uh, we do grants as well. The NIH stuff, we work through that. Um, those are pretty much the ones I know. That go through. There's a lot of academic conferences and, and conversations start there. We do a lot of uh, networking at those academic conferences. A lot. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi. I had um, perhaps a naive question, but uh, just on the face of it, you would think that repurposing would be a very cost effective way to develop a drug for an unmet need. And so I was wondering over the course of all of your experiences, have you ever had any um, traction approaching the payers to say, look, you're paying all this money for supportive care for a treatment that has no um, real efficacy or things like that, and, and convinced like a Kaiser to pony up money to repurpose a drug for an indication or something like that? Yeah, I, I've never heard of that happening. I don't know about you guys. So I haven't heard of that historically, but I, I do know um, a few of our advisors who are helping us explore that now. So I, I think it may be coming as, certainly as payers um, see the costs of healthcare just continuing to balloon, trying to figure out some way to hedge against their future exposure might happen. Any other questions from the audience? So what sort of ways can adverse effects help guide the repurposing efforts in terms of adverse effects and how you can use that to guide repurposing efforts? Well, that's, I, I think that falls more into the formulation kind of play, making it safer by, by changing your, something with your dosing or your formulation to lower uh, what you're getting in the bloodstream, assuming that your adverse event is caused, there's off-target and on-target adverse, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on there. So as long as it's a, a straight on-target effect, if it's an off-target effect, maybe you can get the dose down by changing your your uh, route of administration or your formulation somehow, but if it's an on-target effect, I I yeah, I don't I'm that's kind of where you go. Well, <clears throat> one slightly different way of looking at it is you know for some you know antidepressants for example SNRIs and uh, SSRIs have been known to cause you know uh, uh, decreased libido and uh, and um, um, sexual you know interest in general. And some people, some people have thought about using the side effect to their advantage by developing them for um, um, premature ejaculation, for example. So you know, one can actually see a side effect in the molecule that can be used for, um, you know, or can be leveraged for treatment in a different patient indication, for example. I've also heard of scenarios where. Um, in order to avoid an adverse event, you are forced to reformulate or you're forced to have a REMS or something that you are in fact forced to do. Um, it's the old adage, necessity is the mother of invention. It can lead to new IP. So in the case of uh, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, uh, one of their earliest pieces of IT, IP was actually their distribution system, which was designed to safely distribute the drug. Uh, another piece of IP is a finding about a drug-drug interaction which had a safety uh, impact and made it into the label and uh, 
would have to have been duplicated in the generic, and yet they have a patent preventing people from, from listing that. Uh, and then another scenario that I'm involved with is trying to reformulate a drug that has extensive first pass metabolism. And the theory is that if you avoid the first pass metabolism, then you avoid a liver toxicity issue and it unlocks a lot of value. So I think adverse events can be a path to creating value if you, know, you, if you figure out how to fix them or you know, solve them. Is there a question in the back? So one of the things that uh, I think William, you mentioned earlier was um, some really smart people looking at the uh, compounds that had failed historically. Um, and I'm just curious if, if companies you think in general are going to make it easier for um, clinicians like, uh, like this uh, young lady here um, to, to access that information. So like the AstraZeneca Open Innovation Program, um, do you think that's going to become more common in pharmaceutical companies or uh, large biotechs, et cetera? I don't know how familiar you are with the uh, AstraZeneca Open Innovation Program. Yeah, so I kind of doubt it. Um, um, when we were working hard on repurposing uh, strategies and startups, um, one of the things that we ran into was kind of a constant um, uh, resistance from Big Pharma because of the administrative hassle and burden of doing this. Um, and so I, uh, it's just th there are a couple of companies that will be innovative in that way, but but most. Uh, kind of shy away from extra um, administrative stuff that they have to do in order to interact with the outside world. But I, <clears throat> I think it has to be a wheel from the pharma companies as well. I mean, I've worked for big pharmas as well, such as Roche, for example. Um, you know, people come and go, projects come and go, and there are a lot of shelf compounds. Some of them are really, really good. Uh, but because the people are gone, there's no one really tricking, you know, keeping track of what's available. And so even, even inside the company, if you try to um, um, you know, create an effort to go and see what's out there that you could be repurposing you know, within the company, even that is you know, almost mission impossible. So coming from the outside, I think, is very challenging. No, not all the companies are the same. I'm just talking about <laughs> the ones that have experience. But. Yeah. but it seems like some of the companies are doing it. Yeah. I think. It's, it's really opening the kimono, you know? It's because it, it, when you start releasing that kind of information, you're not just telling about the drug. To a certain extent, you're also telling about how your company develops the drug. And a lot of times, people are reluctant mm -hmm. to, to make those kinds of strategies public. Gilead, uh, we're, you know, everybody's, oh, you're a big pharma now. But really, we're, we're actually small pharma. We just made a lot of money, and that made us big pharma. But we still run ourselves very much as small pharma. So we have incredibly small staff. Um, we, we're, we're, our market cap is now bigger than GSK. We're creeping up on Merck, but we still only have 20 people in our IP department, which, I mean, they have hundreds, hundreds. So a lot of what we do is done on a very lean, very quick basis, and uh, we have structures in place to help move things forward quickly and efficiently, and strategy, you know, th that kind of stuff w wouldn't be something that we would ever want to, I think, go public with. It's just part of our, our company's operating structure, and that, that wouldn't be something that we would necessarily want to share. I don't know about other companies wanting to do that. And for us, um, things that get pulled when we shut a project down, we do. It does go through a BD pipeline, and we do make them available for out license in our BD. We have out licensed a number of things. Just as a quick comment, maybe to follow that up, is some of the ethical implications that physicians can sometimes get bound up in. Um, you want to make sure that you have good working relationships with pharma, but you have to make sure you're not too close. So. That's true. Is there anything distinct about repurposing a small molecule for a molecular diagnostic used in one disease and then taking that for a totally different indication in a different disease? You're going from a diagnostic to a therapeutic? So a diagnostic in both scenarios, but a totally different target. But it I haven't thought of it. I haven't seen it. Well, for diagnostics, you're going to have to keep in mind Myriad. 
And uh, you know, you're going to have to keep in mind Myriad now and the correlation. So whatever science you're using to make your correlation to your new diagnostic method, hopefully, is pretty new. So keep that in mind. But um, and then I can't think of two. I mean, diagnostic IP. We there are companies that do it, and there are companies that don't. So you'll have a different market that you'll be going. For a disease that has no molecular-based diagnostic, and they're testing new drugs, so you know, I often hear a companion diagnostic might be used to test the efficacy of a drug in any clinical trial. If there, if there's no diagnostic to do such thing, what I mean is that exciting or not? I guess is my basic uh, question. Internally, we'd love it. Internally, I don't know whether or not we would. Um, the IP on assays and enforceability. I mean, you take it to a diagnostic company, and they'll develop that. That would be something they would be more interested in rather than, I think, straight big pharma, because okay. that's not normally the kind of market where we would be going off I, and enforcing. I guess maybe a diagnostic being a non-invasive um, human diagnosis. So it would be within the human. It goes into humans. Right. Right. Okay. But. I mean, we we do a lot of diagnostics. Can be a really great tool for uh, moving a drug forward, particularly if you're in a, a, n a new mechanism, a novel mechanism, and you, you want to show efficacy or you're using that diagnostic to, pre to predict a subpopulation that your drug will be more effective in based on your understanding of the, of the mechanism behind it. Um, that has value, but, but as a product to develop, most, co I mean, J&J &J has, has their diagnostics rush, but like a lot of companies don't do diagnostics. So, I mean, we'd be interested in it, but would we ever market it? No, probably not. Or to make a, month, a buck off of it, we out license it or something. But it does have value, yeah. An invested view of, of, of repurposing. You know, what what would make you as an investor interested? Put you on the spot here. Um, in 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 a repurposing project, what what would it have to look like in terms of IP, in terms of market size? Where what would that look like? Well, so it really follows along the lines that we talked about earlier. I think venture investors are are, are most interested when. Um, um, two things happen: risk is reduced, and uh, something looks big at the end of the at the end of the development process. And so, inherently, this this strategy leads you to um, de-risked assets. And so, um, I was talking to somebody a couple of days ago who had um, it was astonishing, but said, "Look, I can get to a phase two result for ten million dollars." Um, and uh, I pushed and probed for. A half an hour, and I couldn't get that number to be bigger than ten million dollars, and that's just that's just unheard of. So you know, you kind of think repurposing drugs—that's the same kind of thing you'd be thinking about. It wouldn't cost sixty million dollars to get to phase two; it costs ten or twenty or something like that. So 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 the first thing is it genuinely is something that has had a lot of bucks spent on it by somebody else, and there's a really good drug master file or something that looks like a drug master file that you can take advantage of, and then and then. The, the big thing that we've talked about before is that there's a big carrot at the end of this, that, that, um, that you're going after a big cancer indication or a bunch of cancer indications or something in orphan disease. Um, uh, because, like it or not, we're lemmings, the pharma industry is lemmings, and uh, the, all of the big game right now is in cancer and orphan disease. And, and then everything else kind of doesn't really matter as much. Um, diabetes still matters, and um, congestive heart failure matters, and there's a bunch of stuff out there that matters, but, but for, for little companies trying to get started, it's harder. Um, and so you wind up doing other sorts of strategies like chasing hot targets and getting lead series and things like that. So it's basically, boy, you can get there for a lot less than the typical 50 or $60 million. And when you get there, you'll be taken out or you'll go public for a really big number. Um, and so all of that goes to say that repurposing like drug delivery, like a bunch of other stuff, is a means to an end. And the end is, wow, there's a really a big outcome at the end of this. Anyone else like to comment on, on that? You know, what's you know, what does it need to look like to move move a repurposing project forward? Your claim to fame can't be that you're a repurposing company, <laughs> <laughs> but there are repurposing companies. Yes, yeah, 
There are. I, I think if that, I mean, but, you know, the Jazz Pharmaceutical case, they started off perhaps as repurposed, but that's not necessarily how they ended. So I think they had a lot of other things going on to them besides that that strategy. I, I guess my only comment in, in, as an investor is, or as a former investor, was that if you go in there and the first slide is, well, we're a repurposing company, for me, that would have, you know, that's just not enough. There's got to be more to it than that. Right. The, the market has to make sense, the, the upside scenario has to make sense, and it just so happens that repurposes your strategy to get there, fantastic. So we've been speaking about repurposing for the past five uh, to ten years, and I'm just curious if any members of the panel would say, why hasn't there been a floodgate? Um, you know, there's companies that are set up to use the high throughput screening approach, whether it's using genomics, uh, proteomics or even looking, you know, big data, mining the databases, but you really hear about a handful of examples where a drug has been successfully brought on the market. So would any, anyone like to comment? Do you see just at us being at the cliff or why haven't there been more examples and successes? Well, <clears throat> I think for the past five or ten years, you know, the answer is the economy, right? Yeah. Uh, and the dry up in funding. Other than that, you know, there are trends in funding as well, you know, like Brian said, now it's oncology or inflammation or whatever, you know, the big thing is. Uh, five years down the road, it's going to be different. Um, and, you know, same for repurposing, you know, it once was very hot, especially, you know, I think probably in the early 2000 or so, maybe earlier. Um, and now for some reason, it's not anymore. So it is what it is. And if you can fund it, then it doesn't go anywhere. So you don't see them. Uh, quick question. Is there still interest in finding old and cold assets from geographies such as Russia? I'm thinking of the Dimebon kind of story. Are folks still doing that? Pfizer, Medivation, Dimebon, any other examples out there? We've occasionally taken a look at something old and cold from... from it's, it's actually a fascinating thing to try to figure out the regular, regulatory standpoint, particularly if it's a, a, a drug that's been approved in a... In a in an Eastern Bloc country, does that count for regulatory approval to your for your data exclusivity? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a tricky question. You get different answers from people. But uh, and people still do look, yeah. They're viable compounds. Um. I think the challenge a lot of times is um, whether or not it gives you any cost advantage in development, because uh, generally you're going to have to repeat toxicology and essentially start from s step one. And you may go into it knowing the answer, which is great, because your, your risk is lower if you know it's already safely used in a large population and you know it's going to work, but you still have to fund the work. And uh, so when people stack that up against a novel mechanism and a new indication, it's just harder to get people excited about that um, because the the lower risk is theoretical and it's not a lower cost to develop and so any other questions from the audience if not i think i might turn it over to kathy for some closing remarks unless the panel had any last thoughts mm -hmm. i'd like to know oh, sure. each member of the panel thinks that repurposing is a good opportunity. There's one that they would be, you know, obviously some of you are still involved in that um, anyway. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, uh, we've heard a lot about the challenges and, and they are clear, you know, that there are challenges here. Um, but if you're an academic doing basic research, you come up with a new plot or a clinician, um, which, which looks good, looks like it'll help patients, maybe even have a, a decent market. Um, you know, would, would you encourage people to take this opportunity or see it as a bigger challenge than drug discovery per se, perhaps? Perhaps I can have a comment from each of you. Well, again, I don't know. As, a, as an entrepreneur, I think you've got to do what you care about. So if, if it's something, uh, period. So I think if you have an opportunity that happens to be repurposing, I think I'd say go for it. Um, you, you know, my company, we're not necessarily doing it, but if it were you know, if it just happened to be a repurposed library of drugs, you know, clearly my co-founders and I care about it, so it wouldn't have it wouldn't have really affected our decision to go forward or not. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, repurposing <clears throat> drugs just for the 
for that particular purpose, you know, no pun intended. I, I, think, I don't think it's very interesting. I don't think it goes anywhere. <clears throat> I think you need to have a reason why you want to repurpose a certain drug. You know, I, there needs to be science behind mm -hmm. it. Uh, there is n need to be patentability, pr you know, protectability if you want it to get funded, I think. Um, but in our own example, we know, we know the mechanism of action is validated um, for the treatment of gastroparesis, and this is D2 antagonism. Most of them were old antipsychotics, you know, that get in the brain, have exactly the same side effects, you know, as metoclopramide, so not really a replacement. Um, we don't have the capacity to do de novo chemistry synthesis, you know, based on old scaffolds and everything, you know, that's not our business. But we did, you know, we, we had a target product profile, you know, that we had on paper. We knew exactly what we were looking for. And we looked for quite a long time, actually, and we stumbled upon this molecule that is exactly what we were looking for. That had been approved for decades, you know, in France and been used in infants and elderly. And, and again, for us, you know, because safety was paramount, that was a huge advantage. And because of that, we decided to take this molecule forward. You know, we have... IP around this particular molecule. We also have composition of matters, you know, around uh, the metabol, you know, some of the metabolites. But for us, because again, you know, safety comes first. This was a compelling argument to to do it, and, and so we decided to do it. So that was, you know, the rationale behind it, and I still stand by it. I think it's, you know, still viable. So if you. The science has got to lead it. That's really repurposing, as they've said, repurposing for repurposing's sake doesn't really get us anywhere. But if you come to us with really good science and you have something new, something new <coughs> mechanistically that allows you to take something old and validated and use it in a completely new and different way, then yes, we're going to be interested in that. Absolutely, we're going to be interested in that. We look at stuff like that frequently. Do you still need to have something that falls into this category of a market of four billion to eleven billion dollars <laughs> for it to really be appealing? I wouldn't know what the. It's more of a sliding scale for that. I think it's more of a sliding scale. Um, how bad is your indication? How how big is the unfelt medical need? Is it a lifestyle indication? Is it? I mean, there are, there are questions about that on valuation that that a BD person that these guys probably can answer a lot more than I. Can. But I can just tell you what what they've trotted in front of me to review, and <laughs> we've looked at that stuff. We've looked at we've looked at repurposing that came from new science. That, so yes, to answer your question, that's we do. Right. Yeah, I think uh, investing five million to get a, a million dollar market is challenging. Um, you know, even even though in other markets that could be a good investment. You know, you you put in five million, you get a million a year in perpetuity, or in five years or something, or six, seven, it starts paying back depending on your cost of capital. But in pharma development, you're probably not ever going to be able to make that work. So. My closing comment would be just be driven by the need in the marketplace. And you know, most of these innovations probably come about because you're working with patients or you're researching a new mechanism and you come up with this aha moment. And I would say step one, see if you can find an analog or something that's not a repurposing <laughs> because repurposing is really, really hard. And all of the stars have to align to get you enough protection to make it worthwhile. Um, but I think it can work. Um, and you just need to be aware of the challenges and the, the pitfalls. Um, and then the biggest hurdle is probably up front is uh, convincing the skeptical VC to give you some money. And once you have that, it's you know, downhill. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Success and billions will be yours. Um, I, you know, it's, uh, since I get to be the last person to talk, I can just say that this has been a really, as I listen to this, all everybody, uh, it's been a master's class in how you think about repurposing companies. 
uh, are repurposing drug companies. And so if, you, if there's a recording, I hope there is, or if you took lots of notes, then you've got more or less a, a checklist and a recipe for doing this. You know, just as a venture capitalist, what I'd say is the, the, the business of what we do, and, the, and really it's the business of working with entrepreneurs, the business of what they do is an art. Um, and this is all art. And, and you can have a fantastically successful company that was built around a repurposing strategy just because the entrepreneurs figured out a way to make that work really well. And, and so the, the, we should never kind of get trapped by the siren song of, wow, it's a drug that's already been in man and I found this other target that it hits and therefore it's going to be a great success. That's just not the way it works. It's the way drug delivery works. And, and so many of us have been sucked in by drug delivery strategy companies. So, so it's just you have to realize that there's a lot of art to what you're doing and what we do. And, and you've got to think about all of those little nitty details that you're doing, putting together and putting the company together in the beginning, but also following it all the way through, hopefully, to, uh, to market success. So I hope you paid very careful attention because there were a lot of good tips here today. <laughs> Great. Well, again, thank you to um, our panel members, and thank you for all of your participation. We really appreciate your attendance. Did you have anything to... The short straw, in some 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 ways, to try and sum this up, I think is is pretty tough actually. Um, but I knew it would be from the beginning, really. Um, when it comes down to it, the whole drug discovery plot is challenging. And if you're going into drug discovery, however you take it, whichever route, in big pharma or outside academia, it's tough. Um, the, the question that that I'm interested in here is whether repurposing is less tough than, than say, an academic group taking an NCE, where they don't have uh, <coughs> the, the level of support that you do within a pharma to create a new NCE, um, and all of the data that goes with that, the optimization that goes with that. And, and maybe, maybe in that situation, the right repurposing for the right indication can be a really good, good option. Um, but I think we've heard some of the challenges here. Um, and, but all drug discovery has challenges. So let, let's put that on the table quite clearly. Um, I think my aim in trying to sum this up was trying to find a way that, you know, that might look better than some others. Um, I'm finding it quite tough. Um, and please, if I say something uh, silly here, comment. Um, I think IP is is an important part of this moving forward, having some level of IP. Um, and, you know, I'm hearing really good stuff from, from Ellen and others. Um, it, it sounds like off patent options might be easier, the ones that are on patent, but I, but you can always find different situations where that, that isn't true. A use patent is probably um, the main way forward that these go. I am um, interested by the data exclusivity, but it does put a timeline on when you've got to make your money. Um, and it sounds like orphan diseases are the answer there, um, with, with a longer data exclusivity um, than, than other options. I'm always intrigued by orphan diseases, though, because they might not ultimately make the big cash, um, but maybe it's a, it's a way forward, um, just limited by market. In terms of investment, I think, you know, Brian made, made it quite clear. It's about the whole package um, and, and, and the opportunity and how you're going to get to that opportunity. And if repurposing is the route, then it's as, it's as good as any other in, in them, them terms. Um, I think um, re repurposing, um, no repurposing project is going to be the same as any other repurposing project. The challenges that you find are all going to be different. But that's true of drug discovery. So, you know, it's not that different. So, uh, one of the things that, that often comes up in discussion is the role of big pharma. Um, and I think, you know, um, we don't technically have a big pharma representative on the panel, right. but Gilead um, is, is being accused of that. <laughs> Um, but I think big pharma, it's interesting. The world of big pharma has changed. How they're doing drug discovery is changing. Um, they are 
There are schemes like the Astra One and others, uh, open innovation ones, where they're interested in getting involved in this. And maybe this is a strategy that will move forward. Um, and maybe it will allow, ultimately, us uh, poor academics the opportunity to get access to their compounds and their data. And even if they're not interested in taking forwards, maybe there's ways forward and maybe we have to keep challenging them to reach that point. So, um, repurposing is challenging, but so is drug discovery. So, <laughs> it's my, my end point. Thank you very much to the panel. I very much appreciate it. And thank you to the audience um, and Terry and Anya for helping us organise this. Okay, bye-bye.